um, scientific um, peer review of of technology and textbook science. It's one of the things that this gentleman has been involved in for a long time uh, as a reviewer. He also teaches uh, to, scientific, uh, to his scientific peers. And he also has a website which not only presents conventional scientific wisdom, but juxtaposed on the same site with alternative scientific information. So an interesting challenge to the status quo and bringing forth, hopefully, new, new insights to where and what is possible in the scientific realm. So with that, I introduce to you Mr. Bill Beatty and how electricity really works. He's also going to give you some new definitions and insights into what is actually electricity. Mr. Beatty. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I started out in all of the uh, material I'm going to be covering when I was working at uh, the Boston Science Museum, which for a technical person is like the world's greatest job that I, I accidentally stumbled into. And um, at one point, um, after being there for a couple of years, we started work on a big um, electricity exhibit. So being uh, part of the uh, exhibits and um, electronics department, I was um, looking into how to explain electricity to the, uh, the everyday population rather than um, non-technical people. So it's explaining electricity to your grandmother. Um, and it, as part of that, I got a big stack of elementary school science textbooks so I could see how to do it right. Since for sixth grade is where newspapers generally aim, aim at the readership level, so sixth grade textbooks, uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth, and started going through those and realized that, that they were all horribly wrong. But um, in thinking about it and working on the electricity exhibit and tr refining ways to explain things, I realized that most of the wrong things in the textbooks I believed, but I had never re-examined it. I'd be basically been taught this stuff um, in sixth grade and below and never went back to, to look at it and look and notice contradictions, even though I'd become an electrical engineer. So basically, um, being an electronics designer, I had um, only a really weak grasp on electricity, but uh, could do my job perfectly well because uh, I just used design equations. And it's more like Tinker Toys. You have no idea how the Tinker Toys work, but you can put them together in all kinds of fantastic arrangements. But you'd think an expert in electricity would be able to understand electricity. Um, so, after being sensitized to this the problem of errors in textbooks, I started noticing all of the misconceptions that I had about it, and it took quite a long time to um, um, get rid of the majority of them. And um, also noticed this in um, physical science in general, that one of the big reasons the general public doesn't understand science is because all the textbooks are, are infested with errors, and scientists are taught by these textbooks. So scientists don't have a really good grasp on um, some particular parts of science just because they um, picked up misconceptions in elementary school and when you learn new things, they don't, it doesn't attack the misconceptions you already have. People sort of pigeonhole knowledge, so if you have things learned in elementary school and then you become a PhD physicist, you still have the pigeonhole for elementary science and if you need to understand something, if, if a simple concept isn't part of your college education, you go and get, go to the elementary school pigeonhole and you end up being a, a, um, a physics expert who in many regions has an elementary school knowledge which is um, twisted and faulty. So um, I basically got my paradigm shifted and realized that um, s the way science should be done is that you're shifting your paradigms all the time, that you should have a large variety of ways of looking at things and what science attempts to do is find right answers. And that's not really the way the world works. If you, um, if you understand something one particular way, and actually there's a, a bunch of different aspects to that thing, then you don't understand it at all. And there's a good Einstein quote about that, that um, if you don't understand something um, several different ways, then, or no, you, if you don't have several different independent ways to explain something, then you don't understand it. 
So science has one way to explain most of everything, which means that science doesn't understand the world. But um, this electricity lecture is sort of a microcosm in physics, and the same things that are sort of unsettling and, and new and different in this, and it's just elementary school science, you can almost pick any topic in science and go into it in depth and find all kinds of things that um, scientists would be aghast about. And it's all conventional. This isn't really alternative science at all. It's alternative ways of looking at conventional science that give you insights into it and um, lets anybody have nonverbal visual understanding of it. But, um, <laughs> yeah. But that means you can exceed a physicist. If a physicist has a math based understanding, um, and how, how, how engineering and science works is that you uh, learn an alternate language to describe the world, but you can't explain it to anybody else if they uh, don't learn that language, and that's mathematics. So a typical scientist thing is to, to say to somebody who wants to know something, um, it's too complex, I can't understand it, you have to go and take several years of advanced math, then we can talk. But that's an excuse, not a reason, because you can, un you can explain things with all kinds of analogies, and mathematics hobbles your understanding because you can't explain things to yourself in many cases if all you have is a set of equations and you don't know what those equations are really describing. And the world is usually richer than, than the, the math that's used to describe it. So this, this is the non-math version of how electricity works. Here's a question that's never answered. And a lot of people ask it. And that you, you, um, if you ask it, you'll get answers, but usually you won't be satisfied. And as a title of a talk, this one is more appropriate. And here's why, because the very first thing I did when um, working on the electricity museum project was um, after realizing that there was a, a big problem with the textbooks, I went looking for a way to explain electricity. And we have to know what electricity is if we want to explain it. So I went to all kinds of different reference books and found how the word is defined. Very simple definition. And um, the earlier scientists used this definition. There are two kinds of electricity, positive electricity and negative. So electric charge is electricity. Um, very clear, unequivocal definition. An electron is a particle of electricity. Then you go to another dictionary or encyclopedia. And now electricity is the stuff that electric companies sell. But there's a problem with that because in wires, the electrons, it's an AC system, the electrons vibrate back and forth. None are ever gained or lost. They don't go anywhere. So if electrons are particles of electricity, then um, electric companies don't sell any electrons. Electrical energy is not electrons. An electron isn't a particle of energy, it's a particle of matter. So stuff is made out of electrons and protons and neutrons, etc. So if electricity is electrical energy, then it's not electrons. So now you have these two are in conflict, yet if you look up um, the word electricity, often you'll see kilowatt hours of electricity. So the, the stuff that electric companies sell is supposed to be electricity. And you can look for some more references and find that the kind, different kinds of electricity are bioelectricity, piezoelectricity, um, hydroelectricity, that um, these are all separate kinds of electrical phenomena that, that involve electrical things. So if electricity is a kind of a phenomena, then um, if you comb your hair and it stands on end, that is electricity. It's an electrical phenomena. Or if um, um, there's, you find electrical effects in nervous systems or you get shocked from electric eels in the Amazon, that's bioelectricity. It's a different kind of electricity because that electricity is a class of phenomena. And you can have all separate classes. Lightning is atmospheric electricity. It's sort of like a, um, a subject area, a title of a book, that you could have books that are exploring bioelectricity or tribal electricity. But these are not stuff and they're not energy. It's more like um, geology. Geology isn't a substance, but bioelectricity, tribal electricity also aren't some substances. And then here's what the uh, elementary school textbooks have to say. 
the two kinds of electricity, and this is what everybody is forced to learn, is static electricity and current electricity. And static electricity is the useless one that's only in clothes dryers, and current electricity is what um, electric co companies sell. And then they'll also say that electricity is energy. But they'll also say that um, um, piezoelectricity is a kind of electricity and bioelectricity. And, um, and of course, there's only two kinds of electricity, negative and positive, and the electrons are the particles of electricity. So what's electricity? There it is. It's easy to understand. Or from, from a more of an um, engineering physics standpoint, if you want to say, how is the quantity of me electricity measured? There should be one answer. So we have electric company says kilowatt hours of electricity. But then some people say it's amperes of electricity because electric current is the electricity. Coulombs of electricity, this is the older definition of positive and negative. So you have, you have a, like a coulomb of electrons Watts of electricity, volts of electricity, or if it's a um, class of, of phenomena, it's not something that has units like um, bureaucracy that doesn't have a quantity. Or physics or optics, you don't have quantities of optics or quantities of physics. So again, we have total contradiction over what electricity is in the units that are measuring it. So I basically gave up on the, the um, word electricity because oops. if here we have a battery lighting a flashlight bulb um, if the battery is full of electricity and electricity comes out of one wire and the bulb uses it up and it's all converted into light and then all the electricity goes back to the battery there's something wrong because as the light bulb is using up all the electricity but all of the electricity goes through without being affected and goes back into the battery. But then the battery didn't lose any. But then electricity came out of the battery and went into the bulb. But all of this is because there's a bunch of different meanings to the word electricity. There's several different things uh, moving in here. And they all have the same name. So you think there's only one thing. And here's a, a quick little analogy. Um, let's say, say that the heart generates hem hemicity, and the hemicity rushes down these empty tubes because every time the heart beats, um, you see a flow at the far ends al almost instantaneously. That means that the hemicity must be going real fast through these empty tubes. And the heart is a source of hemicity. The particles of hemicity are called blood cells. And the heart um, creates them, but then they're, and they're used up all through the body and destroyed, but then they all go back to the heart again. And the heart um, can be charged up with hemicity and then um, um, discharge, <coughs> discharged. But that's as, sil as silly as the explanation here. Hmm? So if we get rid of the word electricity, or at least um, pick one definition and then stick to it and don't use any of the other ones. Then a totally different picture of what electricity is emerges. Or what, what is going on in electrical science, how we can explain how things work. Here is a block of matter. If I rub against it and then separate, you see two different colors. I don't know if they show up really, really well. You see the red, red and the green? Um, that's what happens when you rub a balloon on your head or comb your hair or peel scotch tape off a roll and you get crackling things happening and it attracts and tries to pull back together. And if we look at that in detail, here's, the, here's a piece of matter, so let's zoom in on that. Matter is atoms. Atoms are protons and electrons. So here's my zoomed in view of a piece of matter. And if I could pull the electrons out of the protons and leave them behind, I'd get this, this red and the green. Oh, the dots are actually green there. The video doesn't show it up very well. Um, 
I can pull the red from the green, but that means that you have to break up atoms, and aren't atoms like inviolate or something? You can't, you can't break atoms except with um, atomic energy. No, atoms break up all the time. It's the nucleus of atoms that is really hard to break. So doing this to atoms is very easy. It happens all the time. And if we want, we can say that um, here's the electrons orbiting the protons. And <laughs> who knows if they really do that in sync or not, but um, it's, um, if there's an electron near a proton, the two charges cancel out. It's, it's like... Um, um, sticking a north and a south pole against each other, that you don't have any magnetic field anymore. Same thing happens, um, put an electron against a proton, the positive and the negative um, are annulling each other, and what this is telling us is that matter is made out of canceled electricity, or if we don't want to use the term electricity, canceled charge. And where I got that diagram was um, stolen from a, oh, there we go, a particular Monty Python animation in um, Holy Grail, or the monster in the cave. <laughs> when I saw that, I thought, oh boy, I can do crystals with atoms and, and show the, <laughs> the details. Or an, Another version of the same thing, two, two pieces of red and green plastic. And um, if, if you can do this to matter, what does that mean? That's um, electric charging, electric polarization. And this really happens in matter. What does it mean if you could turn one against the other? Like if, if all of the reds and greens weren't connected? What would, what would that be for an algae in the real world? Well, if here's my um, a piece of matter, if I could push on the green without pushing on the red, I could do this. So I, I grab the green, I don't push on the red, I just push one or the other, and something happens at the far end. This is um, sending electrical signals along a wire. This is, this is um, a crude analogy for what happens. And how can that work? You're moving the electrons of atoms without moving the, um, the protons? Well, um, here's another microscopic um, crude view of what matter looks like. If these are all atoms, they're all um, protons and electrons, and electrons stay around their atoms. This isn't what matter looks like. This is what insulating matter looks like. Now, a conductor is more like a um, tank full of liquid. The atoms aren't, or the electrons aren't connected to individual atoms. The electrons wander all through the material. This is how metals actually work, and you find this stuff in um, college physics classes, but it's sort of passed over quickly, and most people, um, it doesn't stick because they still have all of their elementary school science um, electricity knowledge. So you don't get the idea from normal education that um, a block of metal is like a tank of liquid. And is this liquid um, electricity? Well, it depends on how you define the word electricity. But there's something inside of a conductor that can be pushed around and flow. And one of the um, common um, ideas in, electrical, in the electrical subject is that electricity is invisible. Well, here's a bottle of water with absolutely no bubbles. And now there's wicked powerful vortic vortices flowing all through, through it. Oop, there's a tiny little bit of bubbles in it. But with no bubbles and no dirt, you can't see a fluid flow. If you have a pipe full of water, a glass pipe, unless there's um, some kind of stuff in the water, you can't tell if it's still or going 10 miles an hour or vibrating back and forth or whatever. That You do the same thing with bubbles. This, this that's happening is also happening here, but in a block of aluminum, it's also happening. Aluminum contains a movable liquid. The, the, the electrons that aren't connected to the protons, so my red and green, it's canceled out so you don't see any of the colors um, 
um, as an analogy, that, that you don't see any plus and minus. Um, you're not getting strange electrical effects. But when you shake it around, there's actually a flow happening inside. So how does electricity work, or electrical science, or whatever we're going to use as a word instead now? A battery in a bulb, here's a circle of wire. It's got red and green. The red is separated from the green. I have a little, little um, thumbtack through the middle. So if I push on just the green and make, make the green rotate while the red doesn't, if the, if the light bulb has friction against the motion of this stuff that's inside of the ring of metal, if the battery pushes it along and my, my finger is rubbing, my finger actually physically gets warm. Like if I push on this plastic fairly hard, my finger gets hot. I'm doing work on this side. No charges, in, no electric liquid in there is being gained or lost. It's just forced to flow in a circle like a drive bell. But at the same time, I do work here. My finger gets hot here. It happens instantly. If I go, eh, my finger heats instantly over there. If this was 100 miles long, it would still be almost instantaneous. So sending energy from one end of the other to, of this thing um, is very, very fast, even though the stuff that's going around in a circle moves very slowly. So now we have two things moving. Going like this is heating my finger, so it's like work is going from one end of the system to the other. But stuff inside is going around in a circle. But that's pretty normal because if you have a clothesline, same thing happens. That um, if I push this, the whole thing turns off. Somebody want to grab this and get a telephone pole going here? If I, if I push on one end or pull, the whole thing moves. Like a, it's just like a solid physical object. So if you rub your finger on that while I push and I heat your finger up, if I go like this, his finger heats. If I go like this, his finger heats. It doesn't matter which way it goes. I'm sending energy from this end to the other end. So one thing that's moving is energy. So when the electric company sells energy, they're not selling rope. Rope goes in a circle. So if you say electricity goes in a circle in a circuit, that electricity stuff is not what electric, electric companies sell. What electric companies sell is a pumping service. Because every bit of rope that comes through my, this is an electric generator, goes back out again. And if that's a washing machine, there's a motor. Here's what the electric company does. They have two pulleys that can push on the stuff that's inside of metals and do work at a great distance. And when, when they move this one, that one moves. You can um, split this up and have it moving a whole bunch of things. You have one big wheel and lots of other little wheels. As long as you turn the big wheel, the little wheels turn. If someone puts a big um, friction load on the little wheels, this big wheel feels it. And you have to push harder. And that means you have to put more, um, more coal on the fire to keep the thing going at the same speed. And this is, this is all analogy um, still, but um, the, the central point is put energy in here, it comes out there almost instantly. But stuff that's the drive belt goes around slowly and it's not gained or lost. So like, which one is the electricity? There's two things here. So I think the solution is to bag the word electricity and just don't use it anymore. I don't know. To be able to explain the, um, the topic. And here's a little diagram of the same thing. Battery and a light bulb. The battery, the, the, um, the electric charges go through the battery. The battery does not store the stuff that's flowing. The light bulb doesn't use it up. It goes around. The source of the stuff that's flowing is the wire. Then we, we can go back to this thing. It's already there. Wires are full of, of the green stuff. The atoms provide the green stuff. 
And if you crank one end, the whole thing moves. Um, rope is not a form of energy. Yet energy does go in one end and come out the other. Another good illustration of this is a bicycle wheel. If you spin a bicycle wheel and then rub it on the other end, spinning it puts energy into the whole thing because that, the, the spinning motion is, is energy, basically, kinetic energy. And if you rub on the other end, your hand gets hot. But um, for, for an analogy for, for that, the electric company does not sell bicycle tire. The tire just keeps going around without being used up. Oh yeah, if, 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 it, if, it, was, if it was water, um, it, if you force water through a little narrow channel, it has to go real fast. So uh, s slow water would, um, <laughs> will this work? Water com in, a, in a narrow channel, water comes along slowly and then zooms through fast and then expands back out. So if you, if you have copper and make it really narrow, the charge flows fast in the narrow part and if it's rubbing on the material, then it gets hot. And it's flowing real slow in the big thick wires. So um, if, if, a, if an electric circuit was all made out of the same stuff, all you have to do is make it really narrow and it'll get hot. Um, it's almost incompressible, exactly. It's very, very much like um, liquid. Um, one of the things I found out after learning to think in all these visual terms is that um, a lot of Tesla's stuff suddenly became very obvious. So I think Tesla was thinking in terms of this, and he called it the natural medium. So, um, so if he's sending energy by you employing the natural medium, he was talking about this stuff that's inside of matter, that when you shake the metal block, the stuff moves around and the stuff is always in there. Um, because you can, if you can compress it a little tiny bit, you can send what are sort of like sound waves through it. And that's what all of Tesla's resonant technology was based on if um, um, normal generators are based on a drive belt, Tesla's was more based on um, a tube that you yell into one end and the sound comes out the other. And then you have, have vibration and compression waves moving along. But even that is all conventional science. That um, Yes, you can use um, a single wire to transmit energy, just like you can use a, a, t a tube full of air and send sound waves down it. But you can also use a drive belt and um, move one wheel and the other wheel moves and if you go back and forth they go in sync so so a, a dry belt system um, can be AC let me zoom out here ooh and now I can't read it but um, one of the things in uh, elementary school that I think is a, a huge stumbling block um, at least it was for me, is that there's static electricity and there's current electricity. That they're supposed to be two separate things. And that's um, very untrue and you have to somehow get it out of your mind if you want to uh, un understand what's going on in um, electrical science. So you have to unlearn something before you can learn. And if you don't know that you have to unlearn it, explanations just sound um, impenetrable, impenetrable and you feel stupid when it's really that you learn something um, bad and until you get, get it out of your system, um, you can't intake anything good. This graph is um, at the bottom voltage and up the side current. So I've just stuck various um, electrical devices and phenomena on it because when an elementary school textbook tries to explain uh, static electricity and current electricity, what they're really saying is that in electrical science we have two things, voltage and current, and what's called static electricity, so scuffing your, sh your feet on the rug and static cling and all that, is high voltage at low current. So here's 1,000 volts, 10,000 volts, and um, very small current, way below a millionth of an amp. Um, Van de Graaff generators, Tesla coils, um, Wimsers machines, and uh, scuffing on, on shoes on, on the rug are all very high voltage. So if you, if you go scuffing around on the rug and then zap someone, you might have had 10,000 volts on your body. And um, if you have the opposite high current at low voltage, here we have um, on the graph 
one volt and follow that up, at low voltage we have chemistry. So chemistry does involve electrical science. It's low voltage, very low current, and usually you just ignore the electrical effects entirely. Um, going higher, we have um, the nervous system and implants, hearing aids, pacemakers. So on this voltage current graph, we find that, that the human body and the, the uh, technical devices are sort of in, in the same region. You go higher and you get batteries, car battery, electroplating, which is very high current, spot well is, is welders, very high current. But um, the main point of all this is that um, voltage and current aren't two separate things. There's not a voltage electricity and a current electricity. Instead, everything has a um, different voltage and a different current. But then what are voltage and current? You can't, first, you have to get rid of the idea of current electricity and static electricity um, and stop thinking in those terms somehow. And I don't know exactly how to do that because it took me a long time to stop thinking in those terms just to be explain, able to explain it. Mm -hmm. But how do you get people to learn how to repair themselves once that's already happened? Right. If it and um, if you if you know that you're flawed, that there's something wrong with your with things that you learn, I think that's that's sort of like in um, Alcoholics Anonymous. First, you have to admit you're an alcoholic. And then everything else follows from that because suddenly you've taken the blinders off. So the, the first thing I did with all this electricity stuff is to say um, I'm an electrical engineer and a, a physics person who hardly has a clue of how all this stuff works, even though I thought I was an expert. And after you get over that hurdle, then, then it's downhill from there and, and, and it sort of starts happening by itself. And so as an attempt to cure this, I have a big website that's got a whole bunch of electricity articles and diagrams and um, various suggestions of, for science teachers how to use this um, red and green plastic stuff. And um, I'm actually selling a product through Arbor Scientific Education Catalog. They sell this hand crank generator, which is um, their light bulb generator. Here's a, the basic thing that you have to try, try to explain to people. What the hell this is doing, how it works. And helps a lot if you have, if you have one in front of you to play with rather than just doing it um, sitting um, in a classroom and having someone talk at you. So I realize that, um, and this is part of the doing things for a science museum, that I could make a device to make electricity visible and name it visible electricity. Or it's, I think it's called visual electricity now. Um, so what we have here is little glowing lights that symbolize the electron charges inside of a wire. So it's giant, elect, giant um, magnified electrons, billions of times bigger than they really are. So if you want to see what, how an electric current behaves, here's my electricity pump, or charge pump, whatever, whatever and here's the um, charges in the wire. So it's like my, my loop of rope. But this is actually measuring the current going through it, and then um, with some um, digital counter circuits, making the, the lights advance along. The, like only one of four is lit, so it's like the Madison Ave um, display sign. So what is, what's the difference between AC and DC? Either you can uh, um, spend a couple hours trying to explain it to someone, or you can just say, that's what AC looks like. That's what DC looks like. But actually, in, in household AC, it's 60 times a second. So if I could go really, really fast, so you couldn't even see it vibrate. So then it, rather than sloshing back and forth, it's a uh, very high-speed vibration. That's, that's AC. but the 
a key point here is that the stuff that moves is already inside the wires. When you connect it in a loop, you make a drive belt. And if you push any part of the belt, the whole thing is forced to rotate. And if the thing is 500 miles long, this still happens. So you can push one end and the other end turns. That's transmitting electric signals or electric energy. and then goes back, um, neon signs and little neon light bulbs flicker. And if you, if you have a, have a um, um, fairly small AC bulb, you can go like this in the dark and you can see little, little bumps in the light because it's go actually going on and off um, um, 120 times a second because it goes this way and then that way. That's a 60th. So it went flash, flash. But um, um, if you go in a parking lot at night and go like this and you can see your hands sort of strobing, it's because all of the street lights are flashing on and off. So in the whole city, every single light that's AC powered is going flash, 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 like a giant strobe thing. And does that have any psychological effects or, or bi biological effects? Yeah, it's subtle. Maybe they're less subtle than people wanted to believe. So. Um, you can convert AC into DC with what's called a rectifier or a diode. And this, this lecture demonstration device here, whoops, I must have bumped it. I set it up to have two wires. So I could do it an entire loop. I'll put my little light bulb on one end and the generator on the other. So there's light bulb. And generator, can everyone sort of see that? I guess you can see it on the big screen. So wire comes down, goes through comes out around through the light bulb, back in, goes through and back to the generator. Complete circle. Here's DC lighting a light bulb. There's AC lighting a light bulb. And with this light bulb, it takes a while for it, for it to cool off. If I'm going and then I stop, it doesn't go out instantly. So I can go fast enough that you can, you, the light bulb almost stays on continuously. If I could just go twice as fast, it would just glow. You wouldn't even know that it's, it's actually, um, flashing, uh, uh, the current is going back and forth through it rather than um, continuously forward. And now let's quick, um, um, I, I think the story I've heard with 60 cycles is that um, if, you, if you use a higher, if you use a lower frequency, the, the um, generators and transformers need too much iron. And if you use a higher frequency, um, you have too many poles on the generator, so I th um, I'm pretty sure that the, the Tesla is the one that picks 60, which is sort of unfortunate because for um, getting electrocuted, that's sort of the worst frequency, that if it w had been a lot higher or a lot lower, um, AC would be, a, be less dangerous than, than it is. Oh, for the, for the very large generators? And um, um, aircraft, to make the transformers and generators much lighter, they use 400 cycles. And uh, so if you put a loudspeaker on, on um, if you plug a loudspeaker into the wall, um, if it's a 2,000 watt loudspeaker, it'll just go uh, really, really loud because a generator is a, a, an, um, an audio oscillator at 60 cycles. There's no real difference between something that creates a signal and something that sends um, usable power. It's um, a, a all a matter of what the power level is. So a loudspeaker connected to a radio playing a tone, um, if it was a really loud tone, you could set it up to run a motor or light a light bulb or whatever. Um, the International Space Station, I don't know if, if they settled on it, but last I heard they were going to use um, 30 kilohertz for their AC power because then you can make these little tiny bitty trans ferrite transformers. 
and then you're plugging into the wall um, ultrasound. Okay. Um, I've never heard what the story behind that was. That if they just if it was an independent system, they but they had to pick a number, and they didn't know that there was already a number going, or maybe they did know about it, and it was some kind of political thing to to pick a better number. And Europe also uses twice the voltage, so it's a, a little bit more dangerous for at um, 200, 220 instead of um, 120. Hmm. I haven't, heard, haven't heard, heard that, so I heard, heard about that, but I would think that would make the transformers big, but I think you can make the transformers big, it's just more expensive, so if you want to save money, you want to use um, a higher AC frequency. Okay, here's, here's one way to convert DC to AC. If my generator is AC, this little um, rectifier thing is like a one-way valve. When, it's, when it closes, I can turn, it, turn the generator and there's no flow. And when I push the other way, it opens. So now I'm converting AC into DC. But one simple thing you can do with these. Um, unfortunately, the, the price ended up being about 70, 75 bucks for these um, for classrooms. Because what I hope to ha do is have them be under $10. And then you can build entire schematics out of it. And you don't have to explain how uh, complex schematics work. You can just look at it and close and open switches and um, run parts with hand crank generators. And it just would all become obvious how, how electronic devices work because you can see the stuff moving. It's not this um, invisible magic thing that's with no moving parts. Because um, once you see it, the, you see that there really are moving parts in there. You just, th th you just couldn't see the motion back to the, um, the, the water, water <coughs> bottle. It's, it's moving, and if you could see this, it would be a little bit more um, understandable rather than having something that looks like a block of glass and you just have to take it on faith that it's, um, that it's moving around inside. Oh, right, if you, if you live underwater, a, a, an intelligent fish civilization, you'd have a tough time convincing them that water existed. It's sort of like with zero-point energy. That, if you're living in the sea of it, you don't know which effects are caused by it and which, are, which aren't. Um, I guess I can take some questions. Can you talk about the 186,000 miles per second hmm. that Oh, um, that I almost need, need some kind of an animation to, to do, but um, that, that involves um, how compressible the stuff is. So, with a, with a very, very long loop, if you um, turn one end, the other end turns almost instantly, but that would mean that, that um, something is moving infinitely fast. If I turn this end and the other end actually moved in instantly. So instead, when you turn this end, um, there must be waves running down the rope. So, there, so going like this, the rope moves, and then more rope moves, and then more rope moves, and then finally the other one moves. So one way to think about it, if it was a stretch of the imagination, is to take this um, um, rope drive belt, replace it with slinky. So if you have a continuous loop of slinky, if you turn one wheel, the other wheel moves after a, wi after a while. And if, stop it wiggling here. If it's very long, suddenly turning the wheel makes a wave go down to the other end, and then that wheel, wheel, wheel moves. And in um, electrical systems, the compressibility of, of the charges in the wire and the way that they, um, the char one charge pushes on the next one by electrical repulsion without actually touching, that it ends up having this wave be at the speed of light. So on the surface of the Earth, you turn one wheel, the other wheel turns instantaneously. It's way smaller than a fraction of a second. If you could make something that was um, hundreds of thousands of miles long, then you'd start to see actual delays where you crank the generator and then um, there's motion and motion and motion in the wires and then finally the light bulb lights up on the other end. Except it would be a different electron. But also you can... Right, right. But um, if you had a long, long hose and you blow into it, 
it takes a while for the puff of air to get to the other end, and that's the speed of sound. So if, if, you, if you have, what is a, a, a thousand feet per second, if you have a thousand foot hose and you go, <coughs> a second later it goes foo out the other end, and you can suck, or and the other, it happens at the other end, or you can set up an air pump and you turn the pump and then the little turbine at the other end turns, and then you turn the pump and the turbine at the other end turns, and it's speed of sound waves running along. It's, um, it is longitudinal, but um, it's not, it, it's conventional science longitudinal. That what, the waves that move in electric wires are compression waves made out of movable charges, that this, this bunch of charge pushes the next, but that means that they have to compress together to push the next, next bunch along. I guess we can do one more question. Okay, I'll, I'll um, be in the next room with, with some things that I didn't get to demonstrate um, here if people want to take a look at um, some, of th some of the things that I have um, plans for on the web page. Like um, this is a little, uh, the parts cost about two bucks, including the battery. Um, um, DC electrostatic field detector. And I don't know if, if this is going to be visible, but um, here's, the, here's what you don't tell kids when they're doing science projects, that 9-volt batteries can be stuck like this, and you can easily build up 500 volts and um, get charred flesh by touching the ends of it. And <laughs> uh, but here's a little demonstration that um, what's called static electricity is intimately involved in batteries. This little, this little thing, it turns off when it gets near a negative charge. So my, my row of batteries, it says that this end is negative and this end is positive. And sure enough, if I look on it, where is the plus mark? There's the plus end. So it didn't lie that um, electrostatics or just voltage is part of all circuits. For, for actual forces to appear, you have to have high voltage. So, so if you're trying to make your the arm hair rise by w um, rubbing a balloon on it, that might be 100,000 volts. But the same forces that are moving your hair can move the stuff that's inside of the, um, the metal at very low voltage. So one way to say that, to attack people's misconceptions, is to say all circuitry, um, battery and generator powered, works off of static electricity. But that's it for now. <laughs>